Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's first COVID ECHO session, really trying to identify best practices in nursing homes to really support you during this COVID-19 crisis. I am Susan Ryan. I am the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project, and we are delighted that you have joined us this afternoon. So Greenhouse Project is really about radically transforming long-term care environments. We use the frame of our core values, real home, the physical environment, meaningful life, that's the philosophical culture, and staff empowerment, and that's really the organizational redesign. And so we're kind of using that lens as we determine how to support long-term care communities to be their best during COVID-19. The ECHO model is a model that we have been, we have so embraced and really appreciated its opportunity to really support um, knowledge and learning and the, the demonopolization of knowledge. We utilize technology to be able to identify those best practices. It's really where we're able to do case scenarios so that everybody has the opportunity to learn to grow and to offer feedback. So we are, are thrilled that you are with us today. I'm going to ask my colleague, Janet Wright, to kind of talk through some logistics so we kind of understand where we need to go and what we need to do to make the most out of today's session. Janet? Hi, how are you? Welcome to our ECHO call today. Um, so we are asking that everybody please post your name and your organization in the chat box. We are supposed to take attendance at our sessions, so that helps us to be able to, um, to know who is here and who is part of our ECHO call today. Um, the chat box, for those of you who don't know, is located down at the bottom of your screen, in your screen, and your, there's a little toolbar with your control that has the, the chat box. Also down in the left-hand corner of your screen, you will see a little microphone and a little video camera. Um, the microphone, if you have any audio issues, you can check on that little um, option there. Or um, we ask if you'd like to share your video so that we can see that you're here, that you just click on the little video camera and that will share your uh, video camera. We will be using the chat box today for your questions or comments or any technical issues that you have. So feel free to write that in the chat. I know there's a lot of uh, stuff in the chat right now that I'll get to in just a minute. And um, I think that's everything. Well, thank you, Janet. And we are always thankful for, for tech support and logistics support. Also supporting us today is our Director of Education, Marla DeVries. Marla, if you want to just introduce yourself. Hey everybody, Marla DeVries, and I will be back in a little bit to do some uh, Q&A. Awesome. I am really delighted to kind of start our first poll. And we thought the first thing we'd love to know is about who's attending and where are you from? We have learned with this COVID-19 that often, you know, we find these hot spots all across the country. So we'd really love to know where you're from. This is the map. This is how we are dividing you. So find your state and the region that you're in. And then I will ask Janet to launch a poll so that you can let us know where you're from and we'll see kind of what region might have the most people here. Janet, go ahead. Right. All right, select the region of the country you reside in. This is great, thank you for responding so quickly. That makes it uh, time go much more efficiently. All right. All right, Janet, do you want to stop the poll? Aha, we have got about 36% from the Northeast. And Southeast comes in next with the Midwest after that, and then divided between some of the other, other places. Well, that's great, and that's always helpful to know. So thank you for that, Janet. I want to introduce two of our experts on the panel. Um, the first, Eric Reguera from Jewish Home Family. Eric, would you welcome and would you introduce yourself to all of our attendees? 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Regera. Um, I'm uh, currently the director of nursing here at the Jewish Home at Rockley. Um, the Jewish Home at Rockley is located in New Jersey, Bergen County area, actually, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm with you folks. Thank you. Eric, we are so glad you're here and glad you'll share your experience in just a bit. And Roy Davis, we are thrilled that you're with us. Would you introduce yourself to all of our attendees? And you're on mute right now, so if you just click on that little microphone. There you go. Hey, hello, my name is Roy Davis. I am a CNA working at Jewish Home for the past nine years plus. And um, I find this job to be very fulfilling. And you know, it is a job that you learn to grow as you work with others. And to me, it's a joy working here. Well, it's a joy to have you here and your voice matters. And we are, are thrilled that you're joining this call to offer your insights as well. And last but not least, Dr. Al Power is with us. And Al, I will have you introduce yourself and then take us right into your presentation. Okay, thanks, Susan, and thanks everybody for being on. It's great to see so many participants and people still logging in. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Alan Power. I'm here in Rochester, New York, uh, sheltering in place like so many people at the moment. But um, scrolling through the names, it's great to see my former colleagues, Betty and Carol, on. Good to see my current colleague, Heather, from Canada. And, uh, and my good friend Orchidia from New Zealand is even on. So we've got quite a good representation even outside the US. So thanks for being here. Um, I am a geriatrician. I worked full time in long term care for a little over 20 years. Uh, and I also helped uh, St. John's Home in Rochester to open their two greenhouse homes in the town of Penfield, uh, which are, are really wonderful uh, homes uh, where Betty is uh, currently working. And um, also, uh, the only two homes, I think, in the country still that are not on an aged care campus, but are embedded in a multi-generational community about 12 miles from our main, uh, from the main campus of the Legacy Home at, at St. John's. Um, so uh, my current work is now education and consulting and helping out with research as well. And um, I was asked to talk about this topic of reopening. I'm going to uh, share my screen right now so that I can get my PowerPoint up. Let's just go there and, uh, and see yourselves for a moment. Okay, can you see my, did my slideshow come up? Your slideshow did come up. Okay, perfect, I wanna make sure. Um, okay, so um, we talked a bit about reopening. Marla and I talked a bit about social isolation too and how we are dealing with that. And I know that Eric and Roy are gonna have a lot to say about that too because they, they were sharing some concerns. Um, but I had some different input and as usual I like to do things a little bit differently and so I thought I might give it a little different angle and um, talk about some considerations that maybe are right in front of us that we haven't thought about so much. Um, so uh, just a couple of things that I've learned from my conversations of people who are in different organizations working through these times. Um, I'm starting with a, with a little cartoon here. Um, I'm not a huge football fan, but I watch football enough to know this famous video clip that's been going around for several years of Jim Mora, the Colts coach, who uh, was asked at a press conference several years ago in the middle of the regular season what he was thinking about for the playoffs. And he just kind of went off on a rant saying, playoffs, playoffs, what are you kidding me? What are we talking about playoffs for? We're not even close to that. So some of you might even be thinking that about reopening. <laughs> Why are we talking about reopening? We're seeing some record numbers in some of the states around the country right now. and. Um, and uh, because we don't have uh, you know, standardization about how this is um, being approached across the country and we don't have you know, closed borders, uh, we, we're all wondering, Eric and Roy and I were wondering, even in states that have seen a great downturn in cases like New York and New Jersey, is it safe to reopen or do we have to worry about people traveling between states? But I think that it's a good time to start talking about this because there are lessons that are right in front of us right now that we can start to think about. And they were not all the lessons that I expected when I uh, began these conversations. So I want to share uh, two conversations I had um, and say that maybe we're asking the wrong questions when we ask things like, how do we balance safety and social engagement? Or how do we balance culture change, as it were, with pandemic considerations? Maybe this is not either or. Maybe there are some things that we can do that actually, by, by looking at individual components rather than these things as two separate entities, we can actually find ways to just do what we do better. 
and, um, and not see these as opposing forces. So I had two recent conversations, one with uh, some folks up at Schlegel Villages, where I work part-time in Ontario, Canada, and one with some folks from the Greenhouse Project. And I just wanted to share these conversations to show some of the things I learned that maybe uh, we can all take with us no matter where we happen to work. Um, the first conversation was with a group of what's called the Personal Expressions Resource Team at Schlega Villages. And what Schlega Villages has is they have a group of mentors in all their 19 villages who help with people living with dementia who are distressed for one reason or other. And the term they're using rather than behaviors or some other kind of labeling terms is personal expressions. In other words, I'm expressing myself, my feelings, my needs, my preferences through my words and actions. And, and what, are you, what, what am I trying to express? And uh, because the province of Ontario has a, a group that comes from the government that's supposed to come into the home and give consulting about these things, uh, Schlegel, who's going through the culture change process, said, you know what, we'd rather do it our way. And they got permission from the province to actually have their own internal team providing the support through the culture of Schlegel Villages. So that's what they call the Personal Expresses Resource Team. And the interesting thing that happened during this conversation was that several villages or neighborhoods said, that they had seen levels of distress among people living with dementia actually lower since the pandemic started. So we know that social, social isolation is bad, but is physical distance always a bad thing? Or are there some components once again? Is it really either or? People come in or they don't come in? Or are there some aspects of physical distance or the way we come into the home that we need to talk about? So I asked them to talk about what are the possible factors behind this. And we came up with seven observations that could be the reason why some people were actually calmer. The first one is that because of the uh, epidemic, uh, there was a need for cohorting, both residents and staff members. And as a result, there was more consistency between staff assignments and between staff working with each other, between residents living nearby each other. And so there were improved relationships, relationships between team members and elders improve relationships between team members who were working together more regularly, not rotating around. Um, so this could be expected to help people with dementia. When you think about it, you know, people with dementia, one of the problems is they have trouble with memory, with facial recognition. So in many ways, we can create environments that can either enable or disable people who have memory problems. And so for example, if you have 30 or 40 people in the living area, and everybody has to memorize all those faces and names, all the names of their friends and family who visit, all the names of the various team members that come in, and if they rotate even more, then we're disabling people. Um, but when you start to stop moving people around and put people together for a longer period of time, that trust, that familiarity, that sense of security starts to form. There was decreased visitation. Now that does cause social isolation, but there was also less commotion. There were fewer strangers. And once again, if you live in the living area and you don't recognize all of your neighbors, friends, and relatives, Seeing a lot of faces you don't recognize can be distressing at times. There was less of that. Also for those large organizations, like where I used to work, where you might just not even belong in the neighborhood, but you might pass through it to get from one part of the complex to another, there was less of that going through because people with infection control couldn't just walk through living areas anymore. There were decreased large group activities, which sometimes a lot of people with dementia can't handle. They're better with smaller group or more one-to-one -one engagement. And they were having to do this because of the need for physical distancing. And that ubiquitous television in the lounge that's going with whatever's on the TV, even if nobody's watching it, is one less um, thing that was happening because people weren't all sitting together in the lounge. There was increased spacing for meals, um, which may have also helped people to feel a little bit more of a, a feeling of uh, space, but still engage each other at a little more of a distance. And what they found was because they really had to individualize, they couldn't do things wholesale anymore. They couldn't get people up and put them all at the table together or send them to an activity together. So they began individualizing elders' rhythms better and had fewer of the institutional routines going on than they had before. So there's some lessons right there for post-COVID before we even get to reopening or having family come in. First of all, consistent assignments. I could use the whole slide to say that 50 times and I wouldn't say it enough. Um, if we talk about relationships, if we talk about people who have trouble recognizing us, then it makes no sense to move people around. And there is much evidence out there that I won't quote now that shows that if this is done right, and that's a big caveat, if you do it well with planning, proper planning, 
uh, residents are happier, staff members are happier, there's lower turnover, there's fewer deficiencies, better quality of life, better quality of care. So it's something to work toward. A better individualization of rhythms and routines. More small group or personalized engagement rather than just the large group activities that don't suit everybody's needs. A decrease in extraneous noise and commotion. Really an attention to the physical attributes of the environment, particularly that sonic or acoustic uh, part of the environment. And don't enter living areas if you don't have a role or a purpose there. And this should make us all think about are these residents living in our workplace or are we working in their home? And how would you conduct yourself if you were with a home care agency, for example, as I was talking about with my colleagues on a call last night, uh, that was the insight was, was um, you know, we wouldn't do this if we were home care workers. Why do we do this in long-term care? Um, Greenhouse is gonna come out with a lot more detail about this. In my conversations with Susan, uh, there's a survey which is being done and a study done with the University of North Carolina. And what they found uh, at looking at over 2,800 residents of 250 plus greenhouse homes, looking back at the last four months, they found that the national average for long-term care for COVID cases has been nearly five times higher than in those greenhouse homes. And the death rate has been nearly 60 times higher nationally than greenhouse homes. Now, there may be a lot of reasons for that, but also it's worth noting that the greenhouse staff, they were lower, but only about a third lower. They weren't five times lower, they weren't 60 times lower. So even though, um, even though uh, the staff who work in greenhouse homes were getting infected at a fairly similar rate, for some reason, this was not transferring to the elders who lived there and the death rate was not nearly as high. And this is a study ongoing and I know Susan and later calls and, and press releases will have a lot more to say this, but I just wanted to give some high level information about this uh, with Susan's permission so that we can talk about what is going on here. Now I've done a lot of work with the Greenhouse Project, with the greenhouses I work with in Rochester and others. I know a lot about the model. And so looking at this myself, these are some of the factors that I've highlighted that may be possible factors in the greenhouse model. First of all, the size and number of elders per household. We're talking about most places, 10 to 12 people per household. So not larger groups. There is much more consistency of staff assignments and fewer outside agency staff overall in greenhouse homes than there is nationwide. Everybody has a private room with a non-suite shower. So this idea of communal uh, shower and bathrooms uh, is not being used so much. There are no shared rooms, shared spaces where uh, you have to break people up if somebody tests positive or maybe they've already been exposed by the time you realize they're sick. There is direct access to the outdoors in one form or another. So people can space themselves without being in the indoors and, and, and around other people. If they wanna go out into a courtyard, into a garden, they can actually create more distance and get some fresh air, which can be calming and has a lot of other benefits. The, the, the workers, of course, uh, the Shabazim are versatile staff. So that means that there are fewer ancillary staff visiting. And certainly there is some housekeeping, there are activities, there is social work, but there's a lot less of that kind of motion in and out of the living area than when you would have if the people who are working as Shabazim were purely working as CNAs and you had all the food service and housekeeping people coming in on a daily basis as they often do in other places. There's better personalization of elder rhythms and activities. And part of that is size. Part of it is the culture and the operational structure of the greenhouse model. There is a physical separation of the households. So there's a lot less of that cutting through than you will see even when there are multi-story greenhouse communities. And the open floor plan also allows for spacing. So I know in Penfield in Rochester, uh, there, it's possible to have everybody who used to sit 10 people at a table still sit in the vicinity. There could be a few people at the table, six feet apart. There can be people in the adjoining uh, bench, which, is, uh, which has a sink and a counter by the kitchen where people can do food work. We can, you know, residents can sit there in chairs or wheelchairs and eat. People can sit in the adjoining living room and uh, even chairs there with TV tables and everybody's still within sight of each other within conversational uh, range. And so um, that does give you some other options besides just having everybody assisted privately in the room, which I know a lot of organizations have had to do because of the way the dining rooms are configured. Um, and keep in mind, these are a couple of things that people might say, yeah, but uh, first of all, the vast majority of greenhouse homes are uh, licensed as skilled nursing facility. And my experience has been that the acuity levels of the people residing there is the same or higher 
than most long-term care. So we are not cherry picking the healthiest people. I hope Susan and the group will confirm that with me. I see her nodding her head. Absolutely. And also, yeah, also the vast majority of greenhouse homes are integrated. There are no dementia units. So once again, a lot of people say, well, and maybe we can devote another uh, session to this, but a lot of people I've been asked to talk many, many times over about COVID and dementia. Um, well, when you have people with dementia, they have to be separated because they will infect other people. But the, but the experience of the greenhouse homes with people living together shows that that doesn't happen, even though the majority of people in the, in the homes have dementia and many do not. So there are other factors. It's not just whether or not a person has dementia that determines the infection rate. And um, I'm sure that maybe, maybe Eric and Roy and, and maybe others uh, who are on the call who are working in greenhouse homes or small house models can talk about what they've done uh, to help with that as well. So um, how do we deal with distance? Well, we know that social isolation isn't bad and we want to get family members back in. And there was a great editorial in the Washington Post, which just came out, I believe, yesterday, where a couple of uh, doctors, Jason Karlovich and uh, I'm blocking on uh, the other doctor's name from Harvard, uh, wrote in recommending that uh, we start with some careful nuanced visitation policies because social isolation also hurts people as much or more than risk of infection. But there's some things we can do even before that happens. First of all, create increased familiarity and trust through dedicated assignment. So we're strengthening elder staff relationships and we're decreasing the sense of isolation. I may miss my family, but at least if the people that are coming in my room on a daily basis are familiar to me, if I have a relationship, there's sort of an extended family. And so many people in these small house models say to me, we're like a big family. And when you can identify with the people who are there to support you in that same sort of realm as good friends and families, it really helps with social isolation even before your family gets back in the building. Following people's rhythms and individualizing activities makes our lives more meaningful than when we just have generic uh, activities that don't really speak to our needs and abilities. Environmental audits are critical. And one thing I've just finished typing this morning, thank God, is a huge environmental audit that I helped uh, do, um, create for the Research Institute in Canada with a practicum student that helps people look at their living area, whether it be long-term care, assisted living, whatever, through the standpoint of how does this environment work for people who are living there, particularly people living with dementia and not just the built environment and the lighting and the decor, but also how the operational system works in that environment, what the interpersonal environment is, some of those things. So we can see whether this is actually creating feelings of comfort and belonging for people who live there or not. And uh, in auditing our environments are important because we can see that when there's decreased noise and commotion, it's better for people. Visitation should be encouraged, but in as non-disruptive a manner as possible. The editorial yesterday recommended such things as uh, giving people time slots to visit. So this family comes in at 10 o'clock, this family comes in at one in the afternoon. So it's not everybody charging in at the same time of day. So there are lots of different ways we can stage this, I think. It doesn't have to be all or none. And um, I cannot say enough private rooms. The two, two rants I've been on for over a decade are consistent staff assignments in private rooms. And I couldn't convince people uh, from the standpoint of resident rights. I couldn't convince them from the standpoint of MRSA or C. diff, but maybe coronavirus will finally be the thing that convinces people that these two things are, are what we have to do. Um, and as I said on a previous Greenhouse webinar, this is a time when uh, all that language around individualized care is challenged to a level we've never had to understand it before. But the good side is we'll come out of this knowing so much more than we've ever known before. And it will make our environments, our communities better, even when there isn't a coronavirus in the building. So thanks for giving me a few minutes to speak. I'm happy to uh, entertain some questions, comments from Eric and Roy about your experience, what resonates with you, what you might see differently from what I said. You're in the middle of this. I'm kind of on the outside being a talking head. So, so please share your, your thoughts about this. And I'm going to yeah, stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you so much, Al. That was uh, fantastic. And Eric, I, I see you've unmuted yourself. So I would love for you any comments or questions for Dr. Power. And while Eric is asking his questions, I would remind you, if you've got questions for Dr. Power, please put them in the chat box and Marla will represent your questions to Al in just a moment. Eric, any comment? Yeah, just a one quick comment with Dr. Al Powers uh, reiterated, you know, and I didn't talk to him before this, you know, um, one, one of my slides is about cohorting and consistent staffing. So um, what, what I observed, you know, 
when when there's this what you call with cohort and consistent time because you have the same exact amount of people the same people who's working every single day it makes a big difference because the deep knowing of the elder they know that's number one and they develop a bond all of those uh, staff members develop a band that they have like a mission, you know, that, that sense of ownership on that specific cohort, on that elder, that you know what, this is, this is us. This is what we need to take care of. It's ours. We need it to make it better. That sense of ownership. It's, it's interesting, you know, I mean, um, and, and this is not planned. You know, the cohorting is planned, of course, in the consistent staffing, but, but, on, but, but the, uh, the bond and, 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 and the, uh, the, the, the brotherhood of, of, of that specific uh, uh, um, cohort, uh, it, it, it makes a big difference on, on, on the treatment and, and the recovery of the elders. So just, just a quick uh, uh, observation, you know, which is interesting. Yeah, thank you so much for that. What about you, Roy? Anything to comment about some of those things that Dr. Power was saying, especially I remember when we first uh, were talking before this started, you talked about relationships. So if you want to unmute yourself and just speak a little bit to that and how important it is from your perspective. Do you, yeah, unmute. There you go. Yes, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a relationship because as you relate to the um, resident, they are relating to you. And even though sometimes they're not able to relate to you verbally, but they relate to you by um, body language. And so you develop a relationship. And as you know, doctor said, you know, whenever you go into the room, and as soon as they heard your voice, mm -hmm. but you know, there is a different expression on their face because they, they're able to recognize who this person is. And so even many times, you know, when if someone else is not is unable to relate to that resident. But as soon as you get to that resident, that resident know who you are and they're able to relate to you. And so even if some of the time is concerning even their nutrition, the nutrition, nutritionist might come in and have different diet for the, or different food for the resident to eat. But because you are there with the resident, you know exactly. So maybe someone will give him food, him, him or her food and they won't eat it. But you know the food that that resident will eat and they will eat. Um, eat off everything that they give to them. So the the person to person relationship is very good. Not only you are growing, but they are growing also a relationship with you. And that is why after a while it's become it's like a, a family. And so you press you treasure those residents. You don't know how to, is that develop a relationship that you'll prefer if you were there twenty four seven with them because just how you feel about that resident. Oh, that great was testimony, Roy. I appreciate yeah. that. It just speaks to the power of relationships. Even with masks, people know who you are. They recognize the voice, recognize the eyes, and um, and it's. Uh, I'm I'm glad you just shared that because it really validates uh, what I believed. Well, and I appreciate what you said, Roy, as well about body language. That um, there's so much that you can tell just by body language, and when you're in that deep knowing relationship, you see it, you know it when something's not quite right. So. Thank you for that. Marla, I'm going to invite you into the conversation. And if you want to share some of the questions that have been popping up in the chat room, that would be great. Sure. So Al, you started the conversation saying, you know, maybe it's not an either or, but there are some questions related to how do you balance safety and choice and well-being or freedom versus risk <laughs> or safety and meaningful engagement. So. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to hijack Susan's uh, agenda and say maybe this maybe this needs to be a, a topic because um, usually I give a, I give at least a one hour keynote on this topic. It's hard to say it in just 30 seconds. But let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, you never eliminate risk. Life has risk. And so all we can do is negotiate risk. All we can do is try to balance the best and the worst. The other thing I will say is that whatever the risk is of doing something, there's also a risk of not doing it. And you cannot look at one side without looking at the other side. So there's a risk of letting family members in, there's a risk to social isolation. Uh, that's just one example. There's a risk of, of um, letting people walk outside the room, but uh, for an older person who's deconditioned to sit in the chair for 14 days is also very, very risky. Um, so we have to balance and we have to figure it out. And it's nothing that you can write a blanket policy and procedure for. This is where individualized care planning is so critical because what is risky for you is not what's risky for me. Your personal values about what you value for risk is different from mine. 
Uh, and this is not something that we can just blanket write a policy and procedure for. This is one of those cases where we need to know people. And uh, thankfully, uh, with, with Roy's testimonial, those things about the, that you learn when you are close to people help you to understand people's capabilities, their tolerance for risk, what support they need to be as safe as possible. But as safe as possible is always the term. There is no uh, safety. And you know, the, for all their attempts to, to help us, uh, regulations have a fundamental disagreement. And that is, they have the resident rights statement, and they have the safety statements. And those two are fundamentally in conflict with each other because if you respect all resident rights, you will not have all safety. And it is up to us to try to figure that out. And sometimes we feel like, well, we just can't do anything because the regulations will, will, will get killed if something bad happens. But understand that when you restrain people, when you medicate them, when you keep them confined, when you take away their rights, you also cause harm. So you can't win. So all you can do is try to do the right thing and document uh, why you did it. There were several questions around visitation and you know, um, creative visitation, best practices for starting visits and preventing transmission. So any comments or, that you would add? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw things back to Eric and Roy too because they're they're really planning to do this. But the, just to say quickly, the things that we ask our team members to do can be done by anybody. Um, so if it means you have to wash your hands, if it means you have to wear a mask, a family member can do that. If it means that you need to wear a gown because you want to give somebody a hug, a family member can do that. Uh, we heard Polly, Polly Bowen, the guide in Rochester, say, "I still hug people because I'm a hugger and they need it." I do the right, you know, I wear a mask, I wear a gown, you know, but, but I'm not going to stop doing it. So once again, following proper procedure should be something we can ask people to do. We can ask people to have their temperature taken. We can ask them if they've been exposed when they come in the door. We can space people out, space out visits. So, or we can start outdoors and then move in. Um, Eric was talking about, you know, the, the availability soon of a rapid test, but the rapid test is going to be less sensitive and specific than the one that takes a few days. These are the once again, the balance and the risk and benefit. But, um, but I'd love to hear Eric or Roy talk about what in the real world you have thought about as far as planning reopening to family and other visitors. So again, um, just a comment, as, as you know, every state differs. Um, here in the state of New Jersey, we, we are allowed to have outdoor family visits, but kind of limited because you're on the mercy of the weather. Um, of course, number one thing is you have to to practice infection control protocol. I mean, uh, by, by social distancing, washing hands, of course, wearing a surgical mask, that's very important. But it's what Dr. All Powers said, you're not gonna police the family members, you know, in the, in the courtyard, on the back patio, if they wanna hold or touch the, their, 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 their loved one. I mean, you're not gonna police them. I mean, uh, I, again, you know, so if you see that, probably when the elder comes back, if they touch in your good, good hand washing, you know, you, you say, um, use a hand sanitizer. Again, I mean, you know, common sense and your judgment. I mean, um, it, it's, it's really hard to balance. I mean, uh, again, you know, family members totally understand that they really miss their loved ones. I mean, you cannot stop that. I mean, um, but, but again, you have to be conscientious also with infection control practices as well. Um, and, and whatever the recommendations of the Department of Health the, the, or the county or, or, or the uh, CDC, just follow it, follow the best you can. And, and, and again, I mean, um, uh, uh, as I said, you know, if a family member has no appointment to come in and visit, you're not going to stop a family member that, you know, who drove like an hour away from, from, from her home to here. I mean, you have to be very sensitive as well. So that, that's, that's the delicate balance. And again, um, um, and also family, the elders misses their loved ones as well. And it's very important. Once we started uh, uh, having the outdoor family visits, you can see the big difference on the uh, demeanor of the elders. You know, they they once they see their uh, their their loved ones. I mean, um, it's a big change. They are they're happier. They're smiling. They're more interactive. I mean, uh, how can you stop that? I will Eric, mention that, that, that I've done a couple of um, webinars on on visitation or, or how to help keep people living with dementia safe during COVID. Um, one that I know is available online is the Ontario Association of Resident Councils, OARC. Uh, they have a webinar by me that you can see for free if you go to their site, Ontario Association of Resident Councils. There are probably others uh, as well, but that's one that comes to mind. 
Yeah, additionally, I would say that, uh, and maybe Marla or Debbie, you can look for the link to the op-ed in the Washington Post that really talked about the value of family members and almost looking at them as essential care partners. And I think, you know, for Al, I, I appreciated what you said that we won't keep people 100% safe um, and risk-free. Risk is a part of life. But to recognize, and Eric, as you were talking about the demeanor changing when people were kind of reunited with their loved ones. So seeing them as essential care partners and how can we be advocates for really ensuring that we, we do what we can to ensure that visitation happens. I'm gonna segue as we have lots of questions and um, before we will take more towards the end, but I'd love to transition to Eric. And um, Al, I thought you did a marvelous job in 30 seconds trying to <laughs> do what would ordinarily be a, a whole keynote. But uh, Eric, I'm really eager for us to transition to your presentation and really talking about the process that you have undergone at uh, Jewish Home Family in thinking about reopening. Sure. So Eric, take it away. Okay. Okay, so uh, again, thank you for having me um, and this opportunity to share our experiences um, during this COVID pandemic. Um, we are still, again, we're still learning this virus and I just wanna share quickly what we learned for the past few months, but slowly but surely, um, we are on this rebuilding phase or the reopening phase in the building, both in our assisted living and our skilled nursing building as well. I just wanna let you know that we're still a legacy home However, we've been partnered with the greenhouse for many, many years, and we're practicing the core values of, of the greenhouse. Um, even though it's the, there's constraints on the physical environment, we're still practicing the greenhouse core values. Um, just a quick logistic, uh, where, where the Jewish home is located. We're in New Jersey, we're in Bergen County area, um, 14 miles away from New York City. As you know, during the height of the pandemic on April, we're the epicenter of the virus. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of lives that lost. There's at least 15,000 lives uh, that, that we lost in New Jersey. And in the New York City area alone, and the metropolitan area, there's 23,000 lives had, had lost. And, 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 and it, it took a lot of toll, especially with our elder community. Um, the good news is, if you can see the trend, uh, since June, we're on the downward trend. Um, the positive cases in New Jersey and New York are very low now, which is whatever the, the procedures or the implementations that we did earlier, it's working. Um, so, what I, um, and we started early, actually, if you see it. We started on, like, beginning of March. You know, the first case uh, it was in March 2nd in New Jersey, which is in Bergen County as well. This photo, I uh, just wanna share this to you. Um, this was taken on July 1st. Uh, what we did was we celebrated and we uh, were showing our gratitude to all the staff members of their hard work and commitment during the, con during the pandemic. And truly, they're all heroes. I mean, um, I, I can say so many names of our employees, staff members who made a big difference on our, our elders' lives. And, and, and again, we are so blessed with, with all our staff members. During uh, when the outbreak started, it was very challenging. Um, there were a lot of uncertainty and fear. Um, both elders and, and, and staff members are getting sick at the same time. And uh, it really turned both of our campuses upside down. Um, uh, there were staffing challenges, unfortunately. And, but um, a lot of people really rose up through the occasion and, and, and we've seen it, um, including myself. I'm unfortunate I, was, I, got, I got sick with the COVID as well. But um, with, with, with the help of my coworkers, with, 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 the, uh, with the administrative staff you know, and the CNAs, uh, again, you know, we went through this together. Um, you can, you're talking about resilience and, and also commitment uh, to, to, to fight this virus, we really did, uh, I, I think in my opinion, we really did a successful job. Uh, we find positive ways and great ways how to, how to uh, prevent the spread of the COVID in the building. Um, so next page. 
So before you, we, we do this reopening consideration and plans and processes, we're, uh, what we did is we made a, a solid infection control protocol because what we did is how can we rebuild our, 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 our building again? How can we admit elders again? So, the, so what we said is, you know, we, we set a very concrete plan to identify the infection as soon as possible because what's happening is we're admitting elders on, 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 on April actually with COVID positive elders from the community where we're admitting. And also, so once we admitted this, that the elders with positive COVID, how can we prevent further the spread of COVID in, in, in the building as well to both elders and staff? So these are like just the key points. Always follow the current CDC state and local guidance. The first two months until now, every day, there's new guidelines. There's, new, uh, there's no information. You really gotta sit down and read it because again, you have to implement it and you really have to educate the staff, you know, what's the trend, what's, what's the new reg, uh, implementation out there. And what, that's one of the keys. Number two is implement active screening and surveillance of the elders and staff. This is very important. You really have to have, to have a very good um, uh, system on respiratory assessment and also with your line listing. You really have to update that because you have to see trends. And, and, and the other one is also the testing. Uh, New Jersey Department of Health um, mandated us to do this, what you call COVID-19 point prevalence testing as of May 18. And I will share it to you in the next slide. The third one is you implement a cohorting process because once the virus is in or you have some, someone have, uh, experiencing symptoms or under investigation, you really have to cohort the elders. Um, and, and with that, the key of that is assign a consistent staff very important because that staff itself is not not other than preventing the spread as well but also you need someone that you can rely on who will know day in and day out what are the changes that's going on with the elder and i think this is the key the consistent staffing is the key and that's what i said what i what we saw what we experienced once we put that staff that specific staff on that on that co cohort area they take ownership like you know what this is my cohort this is mine you know we have we have we, we will do everything the best we can this is our mission to take care of our elders fourth one is based on our the best practices and what's uh, what's out there the resources that we can implement um we we made a treatment plan and a recovery protocol for our covid elders and again we're still doing it um and and, and we have it in place lastly with 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 the rebuilding phase on the recovery phase, our focus right now is supporting the well-being of our elders towards meaningful life and real home because social isolation greatly impacts the, 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 the psychological needs of our elder. We see, unfortunately, we see an increase in anxiety and depression due to isolation. And, and this is our focus right now. We're challenging ourselves. How can we make it better? How can we uh, increase our, 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 our socialization, our humanism, but you know, we still have to uh, uh, practice infection control protocols. Um, so just a quick uh, um, <clears throat> uh, talking point about point prevalence testing. So as, as of March, uh, May, uh, May 18, I'm sorry, we're doing this what you call the COVID-19 point prevalence testing. So what we're doing is you, 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 you test elders and staff members at the same time on a uh, on 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 a on a specific uh, um, um, weeks or or weekly actually, and what you're doing is you're really identifying which is the asymptomatic elder or employee, and after that you know you have to go to that cohort process again or what you call a contact tracing. So far, what we did with this, we we did 2,200 tests already. Only in, in the skilled nursing building, not, not, not including the assistant. And we're still doing it, actually. Uh, this week, we're, doing, we're testing both elders and, and uh, staff members um, uh, about the point prevalence testing. So considerations for cohorting. Um, just a quick tip. Before, before you admit elders or you have a, a, a positive elder in the building or under investigation, you need to assign and identify a specific cohort in a wing or a unit or a household because this really spreads, uh, um, slows down the spread of the virus or, or even stop the spread of the virus. Um, I have the links on the, um, 
uh, on the slide, um, what are the um, guidance for, for point prevalence testing, uh, cohorting, and, and also with, um, with infection control practices as well. So if you guys want to see that further, it's, it's, in the, uh, it's in the link. So this is a copy of our COVID-19 management protocol. We changed this probably four times already because every day there's new recommendations, there's new guidelines. As you see on top, Plaquenil is no longer recommended. They, we thought that Plaquenil was the magic medicine, you know, in the beginning of the uh, COVID phase, but it wasn't. So as of May 12, we stopped giving Plaquenil to the elders. Um, one, one, one suggestion, um, before the COVID started, the outbreak started in our building, the clinical team had a very strong discussion about the progression of the disease to the family members and the elders. What is the treatment goal for, 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 for the elders? And, and again, very important, the code status. I mean, I, I, because this is what it, uh, what it determines what will be the treatment plan for the elder. And next slide. Um, also, we develop, this is a copy for the guidelines for recovering COVID-19 elders. And this is are the conditions that we're seeing post-COVID of a recovering elder. Not only um, physical deconditioning that we're seeing, it's also the psychological well-being. There, we see a lot of um, increase in depression and anxiety from, from social isolation. And, and, and also because of this, you know, they, 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 it's very difficult for, for, for the elders to recover. So our, our focus right now is what we're challenging every staff members, what can we do? How can we make, how can we improve the humanism, improve, lessen the isolation, but yet we'll still have to follow the infection control guidelines and practices. You, have, you need that balance. Um, so these are like the examples that what we did and we're still exploring that what we can do further. Um, talking about empowered staff, you know, on your left side, you know, this is a, one of our CNA. His name is Dominic. On, uh, on mid-May, he approached me. You know what, Eric? I, have, I, I see a lot of elders asking for a haircut. And, and he is a CNA. I can cut the elders' hair, you know, the men's, men's hair. So I told him, listen, before you do that, why don't you test two, two staff members first? You know what I mean? <laughs> and then we'll see. But again, he did very well. We're still doing it. A simple act of gesture we see with an elder, it makes a big difference. An elder who had a haircut for not, not even, not, no haircut for two months, and he said, you know, one elder said, I feel like I'm human again. A simple gesture makes a big difference. Um, our activity staff, uh, they, they, uh, they, not only they're doing, they're customized their activity. Instead of like a big group activity, you know, they, they have a small activity, which was being done on the hallway, there's three elders socially distanced. They're enjoying that. And also they're doing virtual chair exercises. You know, they, they always show this in the morning and elders really do love it. Um, when the weather gets uh, a little bit warmer and nicer in May, we, 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 we implemented outdoor concerts, outdoor window concerts. And, and elders really do love it. And, um, and, and we're still doing it actually. Um, Outdoor family visits, as I said, uh, the Department of Health uh, allowed us to have outdoor family visits as of June 14. That was Father's Day. And so this was a monumental moment. It was Father's Day. All the male elders, about the dads, you know, they were downstairs. You know, it, it was, it was kind of kind of kind of a heartwarming when you see that that reconnection again with the family members and the and, and the elders. So we're challenging ourselves. How can we make it? heartwarming and festive. So what we did, we pretended like a club Jewish home. We're, 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 we're serving uh, fruit smoothies. Uh, we're serving uh, um, non-alcoholic drinks. I mean, um, and, and, and again, I mean, uh, ice cream, both elders and family members really enjoyed the stay, the, 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 the visits, uh, which is very, very positive. Um, lastly, we don't forget about our staff. Every Wednesday, I'm sorry, every Wednesday, we have a special meal for the staff members. Uh, we have theme meals such as uh, uh, Italian or, 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 or Mexican meal. I mean, staff really do appreciate that. And also, who doesn't like an ice cream truck? I mean, uh, <laughs> we have <laughs> soft ice cream, my favorite. So anyway, um, we, we have that as just a token of simple appreciation to the staff members, a good morale boost. Um, the next slideshow, I just wanna share this to you. This is the last slideshow actually. This is a, a quick video pic of one of our subacute elder. Her name is Blanca Beer. 
Um, unfortunately, she uh, she sustained the COVID on April uh, on early April, and she was in the hospital for approximately five and a half weeks. She was on the ventilator for three weeks actually, and when she came here on May seventh, she couldn't she didn't even remember how she got here, and and also she couldn't even lift her her arms. That's how she, weak she was. But with the help of the staff. And this is, I just want to show you this pic. Um, this is her discharge date on July 1st. And her daughter is here, was here as well. She had, the daughter said, I haven't held my mom for five months. And this is her, and this is the, her, their reaction. <laughs> So that's whenever I see that video, it always makes me teary. But um, but it was just amazing—a very positive, positive, uplifting video, quick video. So lessons learned, you know, always find innovative ways on how can we make it for our elders, for our staff members, and always be positive. Celebrate the small victories. Celebrate the small victories, and and always remember we're not alone with this. With our help of our peers, we can conquer this. We can get through this. Um, and, and keep it go, keep it going. Thank you. Eric, that was so amazing. That was, that was beautiful. That was so heartwarming. And thank you for providing the context. And um, honestly, I I'm, was so impressed with the way you had such strong clinical protocol, but yet you balanced it with that, the whole, the whole individual, the whole person and the, the need to support well-being and to really think about that person as an individual and look at it at that person more holistically. So um, Dr. Power, anything from you before we go to our other questions? Uh, no, I think the video speaks for itself and I, I really enjoyed your presentation, Eric. It was so thorough and um, so mindful of the reality, the science of COVID and yet the humanity and that's, that's the balance and it's not either or. It's how do you how do you optimize both of those? So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And Roy, any comment from you before we go to questions from the attendees? Roy, Speaking any yes. comment from you? Anything to add? Yeah, one of the things that um, also we engage in is that there are some of the elders who um, do not have direct relatives or their relatives. In fact, I know of one, his daughter, he say, haven't spoken to her in a long time. And his PO is his half sister and she's an elderly person, so she's unable to come. And so, you know, he will re relate to me um, his, you know, the way he, his relationship with them. And so what I did for him is that, for instance, because he doesn't have a visitor to come, I'll take him outside and walk him around. And in fact, he enjoys the heat, he enjoys the heat. And in fact, sometimes whenever he gets restless and I say, what about the ice cream? He said, oh, now you talk. And he, he loves his ice cream. So, you know, and even when, as Eric spoke about, you know, his haircut, when he got his haircut, he said, even though I cannot see it because you no, know, he is, um, he's lost his sight. He said, even though I cannot see it, but I feel so, so good. good. And so, you know, yeah. it, it makes a day 
when you see a uh, um, one of your residents um, behave that react that way i have some other residents who they were very sick with, with covid and as they improve you know and i be relationship with them sometime in I, um, caring for especially this uh, resident and she said I love you Roy I love oh. you you love me and I said I love you I love you and she hugs and we hug and it, it brings it brings such a warmth to your heart and I'm so happy I'm really really happy that I'm able to share in this moment because it on, it's not only built me as a person but it helps me how to relate to my family who are elders and also to relate to others and it, in fact I'm a part of a church and I'm so anxious for us to get back together so that I can share my experience in order to help those who are um, going through trauma because of this COVID um, crisis, help them out to get over it. That was so beautifully said. And I, I so believe love is the best environment in which to heal. And I, I think you just had church <laughs> with, <laughs> with what you were doing. So. Thank you for sharing that. Marla, I'm going to go to you and see what questions have come up. I'm sure yeah, I, and um, in the, given the time, I'm going to ask just one. And so, Eric, what's your um, thoughts on are clear face shields okay alternatives to masks so elders can see the faces of loved ones, so particular, re particularly related to family visits? Right. Um, as I said, again, um, that the requirement is you have to wear a, a, a face mask, you know, I mean, uh, which is a minimum uh, of, of PPE actually, or an N95. So I, I again, I, I totally understand what, 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 what the concerns are because it's hard to really communicate with the elder when, you're, when, you're, um, when your mouth is uh, not, not visible. So actually, uh, we're we're looking. Actually, we're looking for a for a transparent face mask. There is available a transparent face mask. So we're really looking at it. Um, we're really uh, um, we're, we're again, as I said, we're finding the, we're finding innovative ways. For instance, a face shield. A face shield covers from 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 the whole entire face, and it got again, it's kind of restricting. However, think about it. Goggles are acceptable as well. You can wear goggles. I mean, um, so you ha you have to find alternative ways. And again, once I, we see the, the, the uh, transparent face, I will share it to everyone. Where can we get it? Yeah. That's really great. creativity. Sorry, yes. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to just uh, thank everybody for attending. But I want you to just hang with us a few minutes. We're going to launch some polls. Sure. Um, if you had questions that didn't get answered, we're going to try to incorporate them into future sessions. So keep coming back. Um, we will keep addressing them as we go. And as Eric said, we keep learning new things every day. We're going to keep exercising creativity. So let's launch that first poll. We want to hear from you. So reopening, which phase of reopening is your organization in? And this is according to the way CMS defines it. So please indicate which one of these your organization is in. Thank you for jumping in. And, and we will be uh, posting some uh, resources for you um, in the chat box that you'll be able to access. While people are answering, um, um, a couple other options for getting around the face mask. And one is to just have a picture of yourself printed on paper, right. safety pin to the front of your gown or, or your, your blouse, um, or to have signs uh, saying, hello, this is, this is what I'm here for. We have an infection. That's why I have to wear this mask for your protection. And there, there are a lot of ways you can communicate with people, uh, even, even keeping your face covered, too. Thank you for that, Al. Um, Janet, you want to end that first poll? All right. It looks like 49% of you are in phase one. 31% uh, of you say you are in phase three. That's very interesting. All right, let's go to the next poll. All right, get number three. Which of the following COVID-19 management protocols have you implemented? And this is multiple choice. So if you've got several, check, check all of the ones that would apply.
It's quite the list there. And once again, as Eric said so nicely in his presentation, these are <laughs> everything is guidance has been changing, but we're just curious to see which of those things um, you all have participated in implemented. Give just a little bit longer. Thank you for hanging with us. I think your responses are so invaluable to us as we figure out uh, where we go. All right, let's, uh, we'll end that poll. Assisting elders in eating, 76% said that, 67% said acetaminophen and turning and repositioning, O2 by nasal cannula, it looks like that was another big number. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, which of the following factors are present at your organization and have had a positive impact in limiting COVID? And once again, this is multiple choice, so check as many. Small number of elders per household, consistent assignments, private rooms with ensuite showers, easy access for elders to outdoors, the versatile staff, personalization of elder rhythms and activities, physical separation of households, open floor plan for spacing during meals. So check all that apply. Great, thank you so much for your responses. All right, a few more seconds. All right, Janet, you can stop the poll. Oh, Al, this should make you happy. 82% <laughs> say consistent assignments. That's awesome. Yay, That's you, really good you. to hear. There's definitely impact here. 47% and say private rooms with ensuite showers or a versatile worker on um, personalization of elder rhythms and activities. 56% of you said that. That's Super. awesome. On um, the open, open floor plan. That's wonderful. Um, all right, I think we've got another. So one more. All right, here, what's your greatest challenge during COVID-19? and check all that apply. There have been numerous challenges, but we'd love to hear from your perspective, what are you most challenged with? And there might be, um, if yours is your biggest challenge is not on there, feel free to write it in the chat box. All right, a few more seconds, so. All right, Janet, you can stop it. All right, 67% say, Meaningful engagement for residents has been the biggest challenge. 63%, we had a couple here, adequate staffing and balancing social distancing, safety measures, and resident autonomy and individualization. Yeah, totally understood there. Infection control communications, both at about 32, 33%. Testing, 47% of you said testing was a problem. 53% said obtaining PPE. That's great. And I actually think we do have one more poll. So let's do launch our last one and then we will go from there. All right, this is where you need to let us know what are future topics? Which topic would you like uh, future echo sessions? And again, it's multiple choice. So please let us know what you're most interested in learning.
We have infection control practices, communication strategies, utilizing technology, meaningful engagement, testing, hiring and retaining staff, advanced care planning, accessing and maintaining PPE, telemedicine, cohorting, and admission strategies. All right, if you are still working on it. All right, Janet, I'll let you close it out. Not surprised, 72% of you wanna hear about meaningful engagement in a time of physical distancing. It looks like also communication strategies, hiring and retaining staff um, are also big ones, infection control, technology. Yeah, pretty much all of the above. But uh, to your point, Al, about meaningful engagement in a time of physical distancing, it sounds like that is one that we'll want to really spend some time with. Well, you all have been very generous with your time. We are so grateful for the work that all of you are doing on the front lines out there. Thank you for taking time today to share your observations. Um, Eric and Roy, Al, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank and you. thank you Project ECHO for the platform that enables all of us to teach, all of us to learn, and all of us to make a difference wherever we are. So thank you everyone for joining today and I hope you will join us again. Thanks so much. Take care everyone. Take care everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.